أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبو القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وجاهدوا في الله حق جهادي واجتباكم وما جعل عليكم في الدين من حرج ملة أبيكم إبراهيم وسماكم المسلمين من قبل وفي هذا ليكون الرسول شهيدا عليكم وتكونوا شهداء على الناس فاقموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة واعتصموا بالله وهو مولاكم فنعم المولى ونعم النصير صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I begin in his blessed name for granting us this life and considering us worthy to exist and to give us the opportunity to be tested due to his infinite mercy, which implies that he has endowed us with intellect, with the ability to decipher wrong from right, and he has given us the power of patience, the power of desire, the power of anger, the ability to be able to fight and to fight for justice. He has also given us the ability to struggle and to persevere. And Allah in the Quran says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها Allah does not put a burden on an individual more than that individual being able to bear. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها When we see the problems that we have in life today, this is by design in that Allah has allowed due to our exercise of limited free will that we can either be proponents of good or proponents of evil. And because of that factor of mixture, we find there are some human beings who prefer to take the negative side of life where they see the glass is half empty. And then there are those who see the glass is half full. Although nature dictates when Allah says, فطرت الله التي فطر الناس عليها لا تبديل لخلق الله ذلك الدين القيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is the system of God. When Allah says, فأقم وجهك للدين حنيفا فطرت الله التي فطر الناس عليها It's a system of God. What is the system of God? Promote good. Demote evil. And good will persevere. And you will be the beneficiary of the good. Allah says in the Quran, إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ فَلَهَا When you are, when you do good, you do good for yourselves. Right? So Allah says, you have two options. You can promote good or you can demote it and prevent it. Those who prevent good become a burden for the rest of society. We call them in English an anathema. An anathema is like a curse, a burden on all of us. A person who is a bala, a troublemaker, a fasiq, a gossiper, fault finder, one who's a cheater, an embezzler, a liar. There are people like that in our societies who've decided to take that pathway thinking that they will achieve success. And due to their misbehavior, they cause trials and tribulations for the rest of mankind. Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وصحا. But Allah also tells us in the Quran, إن الله لا يظلم الناس شيئا ولكن الناس أنفسهم يظلمون. Allah does not do injustice to a human being. Not at all. شيئا. Rather it is man who does uh, wrong to each other. So if you and I examine the problems we have in life today, you will find that it's the predominance of the problem is human created, not divine creation. Now you may think, what about earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, hurricanes? What about that? Well, in the era that we live in today, we're very intelligent. 
people. We're very scientific. In fact, we know what causes tsunamis. We know what causes the weather patterns. Today, our power of prediction of weather is very, very good, 90% plus. And we do know when floods come and when tsunamis will hit us. Did you ever wonder that when such tragedies take place, who is usually the one who suffers the most? You will find it's the poor people. The rich people, their homes are built to withstand earthquakes. They are built on high plateaus. They are designed with many factors to escape such weather conditions. So the poor people are left to become victims due to negligence of other human beings who have hoarded and embezzled the money that they should be spreading to give. And when Allah says, وَآتِي ذَا الْقُرْبَ حَقَّهُ وَالْمِسْكِينَ وَابْنَ السَّبِيلِ So when we examine the problems in the world today, it's predominantly human created. Now, if you and I do die, even if we're wealthy or well-to-do in a very nice home, and a bad storm takes place, it is minuscule with relations to the kind of damage that happens to the human race compared to how many human lives are taken due to the ignorance and arrogance of the human race. At the level where we start wars, we bomb people, we use all kinds of sophisticated weaponry by which to pulverize the human being, bunker busting bombs even, that even if you're hiding under the ground, the enemy is trying to kill you. Millions and millions, just in World War II, 60 million people died. Was it a divine act? Was it human ignorance and stupidity and arrogance, which led to nothing, only to come back and to bring peace and then to restructure? What happened to all the 60 million innocent lives that were taken due to the stupidity of man? Allah says, I have chosen you. I have given you, I have endowed you with the ability to be promoters of good, but I've also given you the capacity to be destructive like shaitan. This is the reality of life. Everything comes to this bottom line. When you and I can talk about sciences, money, business, acquisitions, trillion dollar businesses like Apple, like Amazon, but those are all secondary matters for there's only so much you can do with wealth. There's only so much you can do with structure. There's only so much you can do with physical entities. For the end of the day, we ask the question, what's it all for? Why am I here? So now I have achieved all this mastery in the material world. What is it all for? And what am I supposed to do? You will find that intrinsically built in our fitrah, when Allah said, وَنَفْسِ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا That mankind has been created to be a promoter of morality and the demoter of immorality. To be scrupulous, as we say, one who is methodical and structured in a, in, a, in a decent way where the person is principled and they refuse to violate principles the way Karbala was. Where the enemy was throwing money and wealth because it wanted to conquer the world and destroy the human fabric of morality. And our imams and our prophets came in the way to stop it at any price, including their families. We gather in these sessions to discuss this matter. Whether our bombs are the biggest or our planes are the most sophisticated, it means nothing, as I mentioned yesterday. We could have antiquated tools and we can still defeat the most sophisticated enemy because at the end of the day, it is the spirit, the vision, the heart, the indomitable character of a human being who understands the presence of God that defeats all of the evil forces. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So Allah has chosen us, and you and I are liable on Judgment Day. Allah says, ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ I will question you, what did you do with my gifts? I chose you with intellect. I brought you as my representatives on earth. إِنِّي جَعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Meaning, there are chosen representatives of God, as I mentioned yesterday. The importance of leadership, divine leadership. The constancy of divine leadership. The kind that maintains a continual flow of guidance for the human being is constantly questioned at the moral level. 
And you don't leave your journey without first putting in the coordinates of the GPS. That's the wise move. So Allah creates prophets, meaning their spirits pre-exist us. Because Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَصَوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَهَدَى قَدَّرَ فَهَدَى The فَهَدَى meaning that he, الَّذِي خَلَقَ He creates and makes it complete. فَصَوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ He gives it destiny. فَهَدَى And guides it. But the guidance cannot start until the template of guidance pre-exists. For you cannot move until the coordinates are there. That's why the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad He said, I was there before Adam was there. What does it mean when Allah says, inni ma khalaqtu sama'an mabniya wa la ardan madhiya wa la qamaran muniran wa la shamsan mudiya wa la falakan yadur wa la bahran yajri wa la fulkan yajri yes. illa fi mahabbati ya ulai al-khamsati al-ladhina um tahta al-kisa the event of the Kisa, where the family of the Prophet comes under the Kisa, in verse 33 of Surah Al-Ahzab, when Allah says, "Innama yuridu Allahu liyudhib ankum al-ridz ahl al-bayt wa yutahhirahum tathira." Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. What is this purity about? When we say Allah says, "I did not create the universe." Nor the sun, the moon, the brightness, the whole, the seas. None of this, if not for the love of these five. You might say, what do you mean by this? It's the essential nature of what Allah is talking about. That the essential nature of leadership. Our Ahlul Bayt for this earth are these five. Do they represent the universe? Yes, in principle they do. What it means is if aliens landed on earth and they became earthly beings, they would follow the principles of these Ahlul Bayt because they represent the universal truth. And if I was to travel, you and I were to travel to another part of the universe, there would be a similar component of leaders like the Ahlul Bayt who represent those kinds of creatures there. Allah says, وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ had. Every community has been guided. And Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِ we never sent messengers, but with the language of its people, so that they can explain it to them with clarity. For leadership is essential. Its guidance is essential. And as I mentioned yesterday, you and I cannot discount that leadership. If you and I remove it, life becomes purposeless. We now start to cherry pick leaders. We start to manufacture what we call relative morality. While it has some values in it, it doesn't take it to fruition to its fullest extent because morality is pegged in time. What do I mean by that? First, the essence of morality has no time stipulation, meaning morality does not change. God doesn't change his system. His system is fixed. What is that? Good is superior to evil. Evil cannot exist without good. Good exists without evil. Life has a purpose, meaningful. And when you promote good, you become beneficiary and you continue to grow. When you promote evil, you bring harm and damage and you go towards self-destruction, annihilation, fana. Every living entity knows existence is superior to non-existence. Hence, we are all fighting for eternal existence. Even animals are instinctually built that if there is a threatening event in their lives, they have this instinctual movement to protect themselves, to extend their longevity in the general sense. Everybody understands that. That's the system of Allah. But if I tell you, here's the reason why I say it, morality is not pegged in time under the, in terms of its value, is that 10,000 years ago, there was a generous man or a woman who helped the needy. And if we ask from a moral value perspective, what would you say about that person 10,000 years ago? We would unanimously say that that was a good person. We would not say, well, we don't know what the evolution of morality was 10,000 years ago, so we cannot pass a judgment then. We would say, no, 
that person was a good person. And if I say a million years from now, somebody will be generous and kind, caring, sharing, giving, forgiving, loving, what would you and I say? Oh, that's probably going to be a good, that is going to be a good person. But why not the scales of morality changing? Because morality doesn't change. It doesn't change in time. You notice the Quran is a unique book on earth. There is no book like the Quran in the world. It has a tasrifi style, meaning it repeats itself, but the story fragments. The only continuous story that we understand in the Quran is Surat Yusuf. Other stories of Musa and Ibrahim and the Holy Prophet, you find is fragmented in various chapters and it continues with expression in another chapter. Why does that happen? Because the Quran is not a book of stories. It's not chronologically built because it is telling you and me, I am a book of morals and I'm not bound in time. That's why Allah says, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا كَبِيرًا This book guides you to that which is most upright. What is the Quran about? It has science in it. It has foretelling. It has future. It has past. It has present. It has everything. لَا رَتْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ It's in the Quran. But the objective of the Quran is to guide us morally because it is the moral argument that ultimately supersedes all arguments. That's why religion is so important. That's why belief in Allah is so important. You might say, why? Ask even an atheist, is it good to lie? Is it good to cheat? He'll tell you no. I said, good. It's working. God's template in you is working. The problem is you haven't connected to the eternal. Hence, it's temporal. It lacks true meaning. It's not a complete system. It's, it's fractured. So morality, for it to really work in its fullest extent, it needs an eternal trajectory. You cannot say to somebody, I will be honest with you for a year. Can you? You can, but you're technically dishonest. Because you're telling me that your honesty will stop. <laughs> hmm, that's not good. I will love you for 10 years. After that, I won't love you anymore. Can you imagine a couple saying that to each other? You marry a woman and says, I'll, I'll love you for the next five years. And then we'll decide. I mean, you killed it. In fact, true love should be that I'd like to be with you eternally. Even after this world. Don't say I will love you while I'm alive. Say I will love you forever. For my love for you should be forever. That is the ultimate goodness. You will notice the essence of goodness is directly pegged to infinity. You remove infinity from the equation, goodness starts to fall apart. Try it. Try to stipulate any conscious idea that's moral and good. Hmm? You will notice with ihsan, goodness, hasanat, if it's not pegged with eternity, it is sayyat. It lacks it. So there is, to the atheist, the idea of an eternal quality of morality doesn't compute until and unless you bring Allah into the equation. To say the universe existed and it continues to exist, but it's mindless, senseless, stupid. It's totally built on parameters of probability and chance. But I'd like to be moral and my morality will die when I die. It just killed the entire moral argument. For morality has three components. Oversight, liability, and punitive measures. You take any of these three away, you kill morality. There has to be somebody constantly monitoring above you. Oversight. Civil societies have policemen. They have cameras. They have courts. They have judges to monitor you. You must be a liable citizen. You must be considered liable. For when you carry a license while driving, you are liable. If a policeman stops you and you're without a license, you are liable. You cannot say, I have no law. No, you are in our country. You follow the law and you are liable. And your liability means you either be rewarded or punished. Otherwise, you're not a citizen. And the third, punitive measures, meaning you either get rewarded or punished. So try driving someplace and you get a $500 ticket. I promise you, you'll always slow down when you pass that road. 
if it was painful for the 500. So any kind of punishment is a deterrent. And that capacity brings morality into the equation. Subhanallah. So when you and I talk about religion, we say deen. People say, do I need religion? Do I need to believe in God? Is it essential? If you remove God from the equation, your entire moral argument falls apart. And then I ask you, do you believe in good? Yes. I said, no, you just negated it. Because the minute you take God out of the picture, your good is as temporal as saying to somebody, I'm going to love you for a year. You killed it. It has no meaning. And there is no eternal but Allah. Only Allah is the eternal. It is only Allah who is eternal. And it is only Allah who brings everything into existence. And it is only Allah who takes it back. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Why am I speaking like this? It will make sense for you and I to understand why Imam Hussein was where he was. Many a times we scratch our head. How could you take your six-month infant child and bring it to danger in front of the enemy? The imam is the walking, talking, moving inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Explaining to us that the meaning of this world is built on this parameter of maintaining morality even if we have to sacrifice our six-month-old infants. How many of us are willing to do that? For Allah says on judgment day, who will be the most honorable? It's the one who kept their faces upright. The ones who bargain for nothing. No bargaining for Allah. Rijalun la tulhim. Tijaratun wa la bay'un an dhikrillah. When Allah says, Fi buyuti nadin Allah. An turfa'a wa yudhkara fi hasmu. Yusabbihu lahu fiha bil ghudui wal asal. Houses which God has honored, exalted. For the name of God is mentioned through them. And they are the role models for other human beings on how to be moral. And how to be conscious of being honest and truthful. Every one of us here in this room has been a victim of some kind of, of a thief and a liar. Do you notice that? That is why you notice morality is the most powerful equation. These gatherings, people ask, why do you commemorate the Shahada of Imam Hussein? Ultimately, it is the ultimate template of morality. That's why the Prophet said, Husseinu minni wa ana min al Hussein. Hussein is from me, and I am from Hussein. Hmm? Their flesh is my flesh. Their blood is my blood. And I make war with those who make war with them. And I make peace with those who make peace with them. So please don't forget, in Karbala, the Holy Prophet was killed. Because he said, Lahmuhum, Lahmi, and a harbun, Liman Harab. Was Silmun, Liman Salam. Wa Aduun, Liman Adaw. I am an enemy to those who are enemy to them. Because the Prophet is saying that they are one, Awaluna, Wa Awsatuna, Wa Akhiruna, Wa Kulluna, Muhammad. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Meaning all the 12 Imams. The holy Ahl al-Bayt are an extension of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why? Because he is the ultimate morality. Allah said, "Laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana liman kana yarju Allah wal yawm al-akhir wa dhakar Allah kathira." Indeed, the messenger is your best role model for you. On what grounds? The moral template. He came 1400 years ago. He is not archaic. He is not past. وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لَوْ يُتِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِدْتُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ Know that the Prophet is among you. It wasn't only then, even now. For our shahadatain holds us liable for the leadership of God. That God said, I hold you for this reason. For if you lose your morality, what else do you have? Conquer the planet? And build gigantic palaces? Why? When you have to die anyway. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذِي الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Everything will perish except Allah. Then what is your purpose, O humankind, when you are so egotistic, so self-centered, that you fabricate all kinds of 
interesting facades by which to beguile and fool the human race into thinking that you are something important when you turn to dust anyway. That's a profound thought to you and I have, that you and I are sitting in this room. Tomorrow we will not exist on this earth. We will be in a different realm, and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will not even know our first names. But see how we walk around, how important are our names, plastered, for the world should know who I am. Allah says, why? Why don't you make yourself important to me? Inna akramakum, Allah yatqakum. The most honorable to Allah is one who's God conscious. Who's God conscious? One who's moral, who refuses to lie, who refuses to cheat, who has a long-term vision to be within the trajectory of morality. And they give charity and they ensure that that poor person living in the valley who can become a victim of a flood or an earthquake, that we gather money to go save them and take them to higher ground. Do we do that? No. We all swear within ourselves that when I become a millionaire, I'll start giving my first donation. Shaitan fools us, doesn't he? Hmm? Why? If you're less than a millionaire, you think you'll get poor if you give charity? What a foolish thought. But shaitan has fooled us indeed. And Allah says, he threatens you with poverty. Whereas I call you to grace, Allah says in the Quran. I call you to grace. He threatens you with poverty. And many of us have become so, what we call, greedy and hoarders within our own realm. That we're just building empires when we've given up the love of our children and our families. Thinking that that's our security. There is no security on earth but the one who created us. There is no security on earth but the one you and I ultimately return to. And what is security in between that? High moral standards. You're the best in the community. You're upright. In our communities today, we have problems. Why are our children getting lost? As I mentioned yesterday, why do you think they're so addicted to these smartphones? Smartphones are not bad. They are a gift of God. Computers, a gift of God. They're not bad. Technology is a gift of Allah. Everything is a gift of Allah. It's how you and I use it. And we will abuse it when we abuse ourselves and those around us due to our tacit negligence of what we were really created for, which is to be conscious within the self and to say, what is my real purpose in life? Am I willing to sacrifice the way Allah says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى you will not achieve righteousness until you give with that which you love. Are we willing to do that? I believe we are if we understand what was just discussed. Meaning the moral argument, the eternity of God, the religion that God has placed upon us by which to make us moral individuals. Individuals who will not cheat nor lie who will love and care for humanity because God loves them. Not because I love them. No, because Allah loves them. The way Zainab salam talks to Imam Ali salam when she was four years old sitting on his lap. She says to her father, do you love Allah? He says, very much. Amr al-Mu'mineen says to his blessed daughter, very much. And she says, do you love me? Four-year-old, subhanAllah, precocious child, full of wisdom. You might think, no, it's only a four-year-old, doesn't know God. Let's not fool ourselves. These young children, I don't care if they're two years old, they know Allah. They just talk a different language. They are the most beautiful representations of Allah. Children, innocent, unadulterated, straightforward, soft, as we say in their spirituality, easily you know, taken in the right direction. And then these children grow up to become traitors and thieves. And you wonder, how did you get here? Somebody abused them at a young age. Somebody confused them at a young age. But they're pure. They're beautiful. So Zainab is looking at her father. Do you love me? He said, I love you very much. She like says to him, how can you love me and God at the same time? What she means is that my love that you have, your love you have for me is now a distraction 
for your love of God? For now you have to choose between the two loves. Brilliant question. And Imam replies with a smile, I love you because Allah loves you. See how he put it in structure? She asks him a very interesting question. He puts it perfectly in position. He says, I love you because Allah loves you. We must love our parents because Allah loves our parents. We must love our children because Allah loves our children. We must love humanity because God loves humanity. We must love the animals because God loves the animals. How do I know that? He created it. He shaped it. He taught it what it needs to do. Even a bee knows how to fly, knows where to get its food. An insect that's crawling in this room right now knows where to get its sustenance. And Allah guides it. Did you take example of this, Allah says? Did you look around and see how much love emanates from me? How come you don't love them? You and I must love each other because of Allah, not because you are rich. Not because you are powerful. Not because you are famous. People today love each other not for Allah, for power, for greed. We love each other because somebody praises me. This person praises me, so I love this person. This person doesn't like me, so I don't like this person. How about you and I love humanity because Allah loves humanity. Even the one who's not kind to us. Allah created that person. Even when Musa goes to Fir'aun, Fir'aun was a fiend was a wretched man, was a murderer, was a genocidal murderer. But Allah still loves him as a creation. That he sends Musa, Idhabila Fir'aun, innahu tagha. Go to him. He has exceeded his boundaries. It's his loss. He will be punished due to his stupidity and arrogance. Go wake him up. Speak to him with a soft tongue. Maybe he will be inspired. Look at the love of God. That he even sends a prophet to go wake up the most treacherous human being. How can you and I not love each other? Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Within this short time that I have, I need to finish. This verse, even yesterday, which I mentioned in Surah Al Fat, the last verse, Muhammadur Rasulullah, Walladina ma'ahu ashiddawal al kuffar, ruhamau baynahum. Muhammad is your messenger. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ أَشِدَّا وَلَا الْكُفَّارِ And those who are with him are firm against kufr. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ أَشِدَّا وَلَا الْكُفَّارِ Imam Hussain alayhi salam, أَشِدَّا وَلَا الْكُفَّارِ Firm, indomitable. Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, firm. Does not bargain when it comes to promotion of good. Firm, not ISIS-like. Not the one who calls a gun, Allahu Akbar, and beheads. Not the one who stones people. That's not Islam. This is not Islam. Not to go and belittle Christians and to burn their churches and to burn the synagogues. That's not Islam. No. The Islam of Amir al muminin that Ivan Ali is on the battlefield, he's smiling towards the enemy, trying to invite them for the last second that maybe you will change your mind before I dislodge you from this world as a kafir. That kind of care, that kind of love, Boil it down to you and me on a day-to-day -day basis. The work we do, the people we meet. If you and I do not affect them through such leadership, then we have failed. Allah says, al-kuffar, ruhamahu baynahum. They are merciful to each other. Karbala was like that. 72 companions, but merciful to each, each other. So Allah in the Quran is telling us, who are they? Taraum rukkaan. سُجَّدًا يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانَ سِيمَاهُمْ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ مِنْ أَثَرِ السُّجُودِ You will see them earning the grace of God with ruku and sujood. And you will see marks on their faces because they have given correct value to deen. They know why they exist. And they know they have a duty. Allah says, who are they? Their work raises trees. Firm trees, whose fruits are so great that they enrage the kuffar. kuffar. Because they are so good, the enemy can't do anything. Because they are so just, the thief cannot steal. Because they are so balanced, the bigot cannot practice bigotry. This is the adalat of leadership that we talk about. 
This leadership needs to be central in our hearts. That when we cry for Imam Hussein Ali, when we cry for his family, when we cry for his companions, they are our leaders. The 14 centuries later, we can never forget them. And that becomes the spirit of all these projects. The kind of projects different from other schools, different from other masajid, different from other churches and synagogues, the one that hits the trajectory, the one that hits the mark, the one that's designed to hit bullseye, because that's the agent of God. Like Allah said, uswatun. The messenger for you is your best role model. But who? For the one who wants to return to Allah. What does it mean? Meaning they've taken into account every transaction, God is watching. Every promise, God is watching. And I'm not going to cheat you, nor am I going to lie to you. Because I know, either today, or tomorrow, or a hundred years from now, I am returning to God. And he is going to question me about how moral I was. And they remember the day of judgment. And they remember God often. How? How do you remember God often? Constantly giving charity. Constantly blocking gossip. Constantly refusing to find faults. Constantly forgiving. Constantly loving. Constantly caring. Constantly sharing. This is what Allah means. This is the attitude you and I need to have. Otherwise, we are not complete Muslims, brothers and sisters. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Hear this verse, and I'm going to continue, that Allah is talking about leadership. As I mentioned, the divine leadership Allah has chosen. You and I cannot choose them. I'm going to make a very clear argument here. Divine leadership cannot be appointed by human beings. There is no shura in the matters of divine leadership. We have 124,000 prophets, Adam being the first, and our holy prophet Muhammad, peace Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the last, you find that 124,000 were all appointed exclusively by Allah. Not even a prophet was allowed to appoint another prophet. Even Sulaiman asks Allah that my son, I would like to appoint him as a prophet. Allah says, no, you cannot. I will tell you who the next prophet is with the miracle that he will perform in front of you, which was Asif bin Barkhiyah, who brings the throne of Bilqis and Suleiman realizes this is his successor. You cannot choose a successor. Not even Musa alayhi salam when he was told to go to Fir'aun while his brother Harun is already a prophet. Not even under that jurisdiction can a prophet appoint another prophet in the divine mission. Subhanallah. Think of the gravity of the divine law. Inni ja'iluka nasi imam. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. Musa says, Waj'alli waziran min ahli Harun akhi. Make my brother my helper. So Allah establishes a very clear foundation in the Quran. Divine leadership is not chosen by people. You know why Karbala took place? Because a group of people decided to ignore that divine leadership. And they said, no, we are going to choose our own. We don't need the Prophet to tell us. We don't need Allah to tell us. We will just choose them based on other factors. Nationality, age, proximity. And that's why Karbala took place. Take it further. Today, what's happening in the Middle East? The carnage? Allah, ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all the other pseudo groups that pretend. They're all the machineries of the same idea. The leadership is in our hand. We choose it. We don't need God to choose. This is why chaos takes place. Allah says, I appoint. Who can intercede on his behalf except by his permission? Hmm? Who? Allah says. I know what is in front of them and what is behind them. And they cannot avail themselves of any knowledge until I give it to them. That leadership is fundamental. And it is so powerful that look at the Holy Prophet wasallam. He makes one mistake. Were he to make one mistake, just one. Allah says, لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِتُّمْ Were he to listen to your whimsical suggestions, much wrong would take place. 
Allah says about the Prophet. A Prophet, where Allah says, An-Nabiyyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet has greater right on the believers than the believers have on themselves. Wow. Meaning the Prophet takes over my free will. An-Nabiyyu. Once you do shahadatain, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, Allah says, now your Prophet has greater right over you than you have over yourself. That's how merciful Allah is. That he protects me from my ignorance and stupidity by telling me, go follow the leader I chose so you will never go wrong. As the Prophet said, I am the Safina to Nu, I am the Ark of Nu, and my family, Ahlul Bayt, those who embarked on it were saved. Those who stayed behind drowned. This is very deep talk. You might say, but what about the rest of humanity? The, the human race is good overall, but they are circling, chasing their shadows in the dark. Shadows. Because they don't know what to do. This apathy, churches are shutting down with all due respect. 95% of Catholic youth in Detroit never enter a church. It's happening in other religions, even within our Muslim communities. You find the apathy in religion is growing. Children are beginning to declare their agnosticism. They're getting indulgent into drugs. Escaping all questioning the integrity of modesty and hijab. Why do I need this? What is this garb? Why can't I be free? Why can't I express myself freely? And then you see even sisters. You know, brothers should never use foul language. It's filthy. When somebody uses foul language, they look ugly sisters are using foul language this is not right Allah has honored us that's why in this ayah verse 78 and I conclude on this verse Allah says وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ وَجْتَبَاكُمْ struggle in the way your Lord deserves to be struggled for this is a conversation we need to discuss for you and I will give our skin our lives forever 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 we will never do enough jihad Enough struggle for Allah, which is what? Promote good, forbid evil. Don't be harsh, be gentle, be balanced, be equitable, be caring. This is wajahidu fillai. Huwajtabakum. He has chosen you. Like Allah says to Musa, Inni akhtartuka li nafsi. I have taken you for myself. You know how powerful that is? To me, the most amazing verse is if God were to say, I have taken you for myself. Wow, I have succeeded. When God takes us for himself, there's nothing better. For the owner of the universe has chosen us. Allah says, And we didn't make religion difficult for you. People say religion is difficult. No, it's not. Actually, lack of religion, meaning cognizance of God, prayer, fasting, is where difficulty starts. For there's no vision. There's no purpose. There's no dignity. You don't have any sort of an upright moral conditioning on a daily basis. We're like creatures who feed the refrigerator that feeds us. Whereas a believer is much higher than that. That their planning of their material gains is predicated on a long-term goal. On a much greater goal. That even if death meets them, they're ready for it. They become indomitable. They become very firm. And we love people who are firm. We love people who are confident. We love people who don't waver. We love people who represent the truth firmly. We find comfort in them. This is how prophets and imams were. Unafraid. Unafraid. But the verse I'm quoting here specifically is for you and I. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Millata Abikum Ibrahim. The religion, Islam, was with Adam. Who was Sammakul Muslimin min Qabl? Islam is a verb. I'll talk about it. It's not a noun. While it is a noun, it is actually a verb. I'll talk about it. Many of us on earth have gone astray because we've misrepresented this word. Christians have gone astray, Jews have gone astray, Buddhists have gone astray because they've taken their religion as a noun and it becomes an entitlement. And once you're entitled, like you became a member of the club. Whereas Islam is not that. Islam is 
constancy of action, constancy of purification, constancy of reminding oneself, just like a good athlete who refuses to eat anything poisonous, like a good fitness guru who refuses to take any poison because less their body grows the wrong way. That type, the scientist who refuses to move away from their methodical way of exposing the secrets of the universe. You have to have a methodical system. This is why the deen of Allah, salah, aqim salah, maintain prayer. It's not some ritual that God added upon us. He said, I didn't make religion difficult for you. I elevate you. I'm honoring you with your prayers. You don't understand it. We should. In my life, growing up as a youth in America, whenever I prayed, my friends always respected me. But it wasn't to show off to pray. It is because they say there's honor and dignity in it. But then you realize if my friend likes me because I pray, then I better act with what I just prayed to and for so that I can represent the prayer better because the prayer is not the end of the goal. It is the means to the goal. That's why Imam Hussain alayhi salam in Karbala prayed. He lost half his army. Half his army was, was shot with arrows. He didn't care. As-salah, as-salah. Why? Because that's what the prophets and imams came for. To teach us discipline, to be moral and upright, and to maintain the constancy of the Quran in its nature, to constantly be balanced and to understand what the value systems are. But here's the most profound part. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُ شُهَدَ عَلَى النَّاسِ this is very powerful. Struggle so that the prophet is a witness over you and you are a witness over the people. You and I are being addressed in this verse. We think the imams and the prophet do God's work and then we're on the sidelines cheering them. Ya Hussein, Labbaik, we wear Zulfiqars. We tattoo Hussein. We're just observers. We're cheer, cheerleaders out there. Hey, we love you. Ali, we love you. Haider. Imam Ali is looking at us and says, no, 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 no. You're not in the crowd. You're in the arena with me. God and his angels are in the arena watching us. They are in the crowds watching us. You and I are here. So let's not take a sidestep. So, you know, let Allah take care of this Islam and let the Prophet do Islam and let Imam Sahib Zaman adrikni asa al ajal, you know, ilahi adum al bala. There's a bala. Imam is replying us, What are you doing? No, no, no. <laughs> We're waiting for you to come and fix it. We're just observers. Quran is saying, No, no, no. You are not an observer. In fact, the Prophet is your witness and you are the witness over the people. So, what does Allah conclude? Listen to what Allah concludes. Brilliant. Allah says, وَتَكُونُ شُهَدَ عَلَى النَّاسِ فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَعَتَصِمُوا بِاللَّهِ هُوَ مَوْلَاكُمْ فَنِعْمَ الْمَوْلَى وَنِعْمَ النَّصِيرِ Therefore, uphold prayer. Not prayer like this that we talk about salah. No, no, no. That's one main component of it. Meaning stand up as a moral human being who represents God as a moral human being. فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ Give charity, help others, care for humanity, and hold on to him. He is your helper. You will succeed. Tonight we conclude that those who ended up in Karbala with Imam Hussain alayhi salam, history shows that Imam left Medina to go to Mecca. They wanted to plot to kill him in Mecca, the enemies. But the Imam loved the Kaaba so much. He said, this is the house of God. And God has chosen this house. In awwal baytin, wudi alin nas, lalladhi bi bakkatan mubarakan, wa hudan lil alameen. It's a guide for mankind. That even when the Holy Prophet took over Mecca from the, from the Meccans who were pagans, he minimized bloodshed. He strategically came in the evening time. And he made sure there was no bloodshed. And he psychologically controlled Abu Sufyan. And made Abu Sufyan to surrender without bloodshed. The next morning, there was an attempt to create bloodshed. The prophet prevented it. He said, no, this is a sacred house. It is not a house built on blood. It is a house built on worship, on mercy, on grace, on freedom. 
on equity. Imam Hussein did not allow that either. For they were going to kill him at the Kaaba. He said, I will not allow bloodshed in this house. I will leave. So the army of Yazid had already arrived in Mecca, the spies, and they were ready to kill the Imam. He said, no. That is why he left Mecca. He took his family. He took his women. He took his children. Proof positive he was not hungry for power. Nor was he going towards Karbala. He was going towards Kufa. Nor was his intention to fight. For he had no intention of facing Yazid's army. But the Imam left with his family on the basis of truth. And Yazid said to him, give bay'ah. Give us your allegiance that I am a legitimate caliph. Imam says, I will never do that. Notice how they're demanding a human being to appoint a leader. Whereas Allah chooses leaders, divine leaders. Imam says, I'll never allow that. And I am, as I mentioned yesterday, the wasiyah of Imam leaving to Muhammad ibn Hanafiyah. I am not going to be insolent. I'm not going to be stubborn. I'm not going to fight. I am the promoter of truth and forbidder of evil. And I follow the sunnah of my grandfather and my father. For that is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he leaves his children, family, his young son, Ali Akbar. They say Ali Akbar was an image of the Prophet. If you wanted to see the Holy Prophet, look at Ali, just look at Ali Akbar. He looked just like the Prophet. Historians say that when he was on the battlefield, people, the enemies would come near him and they'd turn back. Remembering that was the Prophet. He said, that's the Prophet fighting us. That's how Ali Akbar resembled the Prophet. But the Imam let him go. Kissed him and let him go. We need to talk about that. That power to sacrifice everything for the sake of truth. The Imam negotiates when he reaches Karbala. He negotiates with Umar ibn Sa'ad. Umar ibn Sa'ad was the commander-in-chief of the army in Karbala. And Imam is negotiating him for days. And he's telling him, look, I don't want to ever fight with you. You know who I am. You know where we stand on the pedestal of God. Don't fight us, for it is your destruction. And you will be exposed and destroyed if you touch us. We are the chosen agents of God. Ibn Sa'ad knew the Imam very well. His family knew the Imam very well. He tried. He sends a letter to Ibn Ziyad that, look, Hussein ibn Ali salam, is ready to go to India. He's ready to go to India and not fight your caliphate. He's going to leave you alone. But don't corner him. But the annals of history is greed, power, like wars. They start with a vengeance. No, I need to revenge you. Like shaitan, who couldn't ask for forgiveness from Allah simply because he refused to bow. He says, no, till the day of judgment, I have a vendetta. There are people like that in our communities who just cannot bury the hatchet. They are holding a vengeance till they die. And Allah says, you die with your vengeance. Allah says, let them die with their anger. And that's what happened to Ibn Ziyad, happened to Shimr, and happened to Ibn Sa'ad, and all of them. So tonight, while Imam is now confronted with the day of Ashura, and I will talk about his journey in the next few nights, how he traveled. He stopped, there were 14 stops he made before reaching Karbala. He didn't want to go to Karbala. He was aiming for Kufa. But Yazid... And Ibn, Ibn Ziyad sends Hur, Ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, to stop Imam Hussein from arriving in Kufa because the Shia of Ali were known to be the strongest in Kufa. And if Imam arrives there, they, they would have a more difficult time confronting the Imam. So they block him from entering Kufa and they push him northwest towards Karbala from Kufa. And as a result, Imam ends up in Karbala on the third day of Muharram. He meets Hur. And I'll talk about Hur another night. But I want us to consider those 72 warriors. There were two particular groups I want to touch on. One was a couple, Christian couple, that became Muslim. Name was Ummi Wahab and Abdullah ibn Umair Kalbi, the husband. 
They were Christian. They became Muslim. They meet Imam Hussein. They sacrifice. And as you know, Abdullah ibn Umair was one of the first persons to go forward and fight the enemy. And the wife was so in love with him. She had just married him. This was her husband. But they both decided that our marriage is beautiful. We love each other, but our love will continue in the next world. In this world, we need to defend Hussein ibn Ali. You know, when I think of this history, just this story of Umm Wahab and Abdullah ibn Umair, I look at myself and say, shame on me, how material we are. This is a beloved couple that gives up their relationship, their progeny to go and defend the leader of God on this earth. To me, it lives in my heart every single day. Abdullah ibn Umair and Umm Wahab talks to me and says, we sacrificed. We had so much to gain. What are you sacrificing? What are you giving? And they say when Abdullah bin Umair went forward and as he's fighting, his wife was so proud of that battle. She's screaming, Abdullah, I love you for what you're doing. Go, hit the enemy. She starts running towards him. She leaves the tent. She starts running towards him. She got so excited to see her husband fighting in the defense of good to become a martyr who's going to die for good forever. As she's running towards him, Imam notices her running and says to her, Umm Wahab, don't go. It is not for a woman to fight in a battlefield. Stay behind. As she's running towards her husband, she looks at the Imam and she instantly realizes that that man is my life. But this one is my leader forever. This one is from God. So she stops dead in her tracks. She comes back eager to go and help her husband. Eager. That spirit of eagerness is what you and I should have. She watches her husband. Her husband turns around and says to her, Umm Wahab, don't come. I'm fighting. And when he turns around, the enemy slices his finger. He doesn't care. Looks at the enemy and continues to fight. She patiently watches him. Until he's hit so hard on his head, he falls. Now he's bleeding. The enemy runs away. Now she gently goes towards the body lying on the floor. She said, I want to bid him goodbye. This is the man I just married. He takes his head, puts it on her lap. She's caressing him, says, my love, I am so proud of you. The enemy notices this woman sitting there in their rage and anger. They come and they strike her also. And she becomes Shahida. She dies with her husband on the battlefield. That's the kind of sacrifice at a very high level. And there was a man by the name of Uns ibn Harith. He was, some historians say, over a hundred years old. He was so old, his back was arching. He's getting ready to fight for Imam Hussein. They say his eyebrows were hanging. He couldn't see. Old. He takes his turban and he ties his eyebrows. I'm thinking 14 centuries later, much younger than him. Where did you get this energy from, old man? Oh, it's Ibn Harith Asadi. Who are you? How did you reach there? How did you have that strength to take your belt and tie it around your eyes? Because you want to see the enemy in your old age. How did you hold that sword? He says, I love my leader so much that I could be 200 years old. But I'm never going to quit to defend the way of God. Uns ibn Harith becomes shaheed. Ala la'anatullah ila al-qawm al-zalimeen. Wa sayya'alamu al-ladhina zalamu ayyamun qalabin yadkharibu. Sawatra Muhammad wa al-Muhammad.